We don't have the papers. I mean, the papers is not going to be here. Newspapers. Monday, the 12th of 12th day in the month of July 2021. Over the weekend, it was all about Lionel Messi. Welcome to Breakfast Central, reaching you live from the economic capital of the most populous nation in Africa, Nigeria, aka Niger. I am Oluchi in Norbong. Well, good morning, Africa. Well, I have to beg to disagree with Oluchi. It was not all about Messi. Well, Italy have, have something to say. Welcome to the program. It's the Breakfast Central News Central. It's a Monday. Let's begin the program with a look at our top stories for today. Well, take it to Ethiopia, where Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed gets five-year term after re-election. And we'll be bringing you to Nigeria, Cardinal State, where Emir 14 others were abducted. Sad news in Nigeria, music legend San Sultan dies at the age of 44. And Euro 2020, Italy are champions uh, after last night's uh, pasta and pizza fiesta. And we will be giving you ways to prevent and fight cancer. All about that. The critical desk now. They should just get it out. Uh, Alpha. Abdin, morning. Morning, Olu. And Good morning. Oli. Yeah, how's it going, Bob? So, who is the Argentinian fan and who is the Italian fan in the studio? Ah. Um, I'm for Lionel Messi all the way. Papers, papers. He said it's not yet. He said it's coming. Top story first. Ah. Ah. I need to have a discussion with. You central. You and It is a Monday. Welcome to Breakfast Central. Let's take you to East Africa, Ethiopia. More to be precise uh, with the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He's won the country's delayed elections with an overwhelming majority. Now, according to the country's election board, Abiy's uh, Prosperity Party won 410 out of 436 seats, giving him another five-year term in office. Now, polls were not held in the war-torn area of Tigray region, where many uh, thousands are living. Uh, in famine conditions. Now in all, a fifth of the country failed to take part in voting owing to insecurity and logistical problems. Now our East Africa correspondent Abdenol Aden now joins us to unpack the details. Good morning Abden. Mm. Morning Abden, good to have you back on Breakfast Central this morning. Uh, yes, uh, finally a winner has emerged, uh, you know, perhaps many might say it was uh, quite obvious. Yes, indeed. But then again, uh, having the announcement of the election results um, a period earlier than the anticipated timelines, the set timelines, and uh, in a peaceful manner with the ceasefire in Tigray, beyond the results, beyond the majority victory for Abiy Ahmed, a stable Ethiopia and successful elections, is the headline right now um abdenol looking at uh, his work the work of president abby since 2018 when he came into power he clamped down on corruption he did try to release a lot of political prisoners he also installed more women in his cabinet but now a new government is expected to be formed in october however there are concerns about the election's integrity 
and the opposition parties say that a government crackdown against their office officials has disrupted their plans to prepare. Also, in May 2021, the EU came out and accused Ethiopia of failing to guarantee the independence of its election. What does this say about the polls generally? Well, uh, you've said clearly there the reactions uh, about the validity of the elections. But what has been the main story is the African Union uh, election observer mission group led by Chief uh, Olusu Gunabasajo, uh, former president, uh, former Nigerian president, calling the elections to be credible, free and fair. Uh, it was uh, some of the other highlights from the outcome of these elections. Yes, it's very well known that there are a lot of uh, criticism from the opposition, uh, from different uh, human rights uh, organizations such as Amnesty International. But on the other hand, uh, the key uh, observer mission group, the Africa Union, has reiterated that if indeed the credibility of the elections is something that African um, organizations or African policy bodies are um, in charge or involved with it, then there should be no doubt. And there's been a very famous quote that has been trending also in the social media in the last few days and also in, in various media across from uh, former President Olusogin Obasanjo, where he called on for respect of uh, African interpretation and uh, African belief in African issues. Yeah. So President Abiy Ahmed indeed has a lot of work ahead of him considering much doubt on the credibility of the elections. All right, that then. Now, securing a parliamentary majority you know, vote gives Abiy's uh, prime minister, uh, uh, you know, the tenor, a governing mandate and focus will now quickly turn to how he will deal with the mounting challenges like the, where, you know, the war in Tigray and his government, you know, has been accused of power and blocking phone lines across that region. Now, the question is, what approach do you think, you know, Abiy Ahmed's government will be adopting to surmount these challenges, you know, in this new government? Well, indeed, having uh, one 410 out of 547 constituencies, that is indeed a huge margin. Well, we know that he hasn't yet posted uh, any message since uh, the announcement of the results by the Nation National Elections Board of Ethiopia, the NEBE. Uh, President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, uh, who is also getting elected for the first time, after getting power last time uh, as part of the reforms or political reforms in Ethiopia, one of the key obstacles ahead of him now is reuniting the country, winning back the faith or, or, or the belief and the trust of some of the regions that not only boycotted the elections, but also um, have expressed concerns of a government's handlings of its affairs. But Olu and Oli, the other highlight of this election has been, uh, for the first time, we've had a Somali female legislator uh, elected to the federal parliament of Ethiopia, uh, because we very well know that uh, we also have the Somali region in Ethiopia, which also had uh, challenges related to these elections. But it is one that is going to show the continent how Ethiopia will overcome the hurdle that has uh, uh, shown doubt or concerns about yeah. Ethiopia's a handling of internal matters. Right. Now, this is a very peculiar situation because Ethiopia is the second most populous nation in Africa yeah. after Nigeria. And we know that election did not hold in some, some regions of the country. In fact, out of 10 major regions, election held in seven of this region. Now, another round of election has been sh scheduled for 6th of September. Tell us how this will play out and if we will eventually see elections in Tigray. Wow. Uh, first of all, the National Elections Board of Ethiopia has a huge relief because um, it's left with uh, some regions and uh, having been able to announce the results of some of the regions, uh, a huge number within a short span of time, it means that what we expect from the body uh, in the next few days is to try and announce what actions or what steps is going to put in place to ensure the facilitation of the elections in some of the regions that had uh, uh, some challenges or, or even boycotted the elections. But what we indeed know that uh, the remaining regions which haven't yet held their elections will not, uh, what they call, hold the country in ransom. Um, Ethiopia will pick up from these elections 
but it will also uh, set a new calendar and a new mechanism to ensure the remaining parts also undertake their democratic process in order to ensure that uh, the country moves forward. One of the key things, I mean, the two key things has been the ceasefire in the Tigray region, mm. as well as uh, the filling of the dam, uh, uh, which has uh, really uh, gone on, um, not as earlier expected and anticipated the issues of Sudan and Egypt. And the, but how it plays out is a matter of attention and concern. All right. Well, thank you very much to our East Africa correspondent, Abdinor Arden, for coming once again on Breakfast and continue to monitor the situation in Ethiopia. But uh, clearly, it was quite obvious Abiy Ahmed was taking that it one. Was. Thank you very much, uh, Arden. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Lucian. You're still watching Breakfast Central on this Monday, 12th day of July 2021. I'm going to take you to Nigeria now. The police in the country in the northwestern state of Kaduna have uh, confirmed the abduction of the Emir of Kajuru in its person of Al Hassan Adamu and 10 others by suspected bandits in the early hours of yesterday in Kajuru town, headquarters of the Kajuru local government area of the state. Now, according to the police public relations officer in the state, that's Mohammed. Uh, Jalige, the traditional ruler, and other victims were kidnapped at the palace. Sources say the victims include the Emir's three wives, two of his, of his grandchildren, and five of his domestic workers. Now, reports say the Emir had organized a security meeting on Friday before his abduction. We have joining us this morning New Central Chief Researcher Abdul Latif Ahmed. Good morning, Abdul Latif. Quickly tell us the latest on the abduction of the traditional ruler just yesterday. Good morning, uh, thank you. The uh, recent abdu abduction of the uh, traditional ruler is coming uh, uh, in a series of uh, kidnaps that has uh, continued to uh, dog the state from, uh, for, for a while now. Um, it is not surprising, uh, but it is, uh, however, unfortunate that this um, happened without uh, the kidnappers being intercepted. All right, uh, Abdul Latif, uh, I know that you're, uh, you, you've lived in Kaduna. You have a great ground of your grasp of where that area is, the Kaduna local government area. Uh, uh, tell us what you think in terms of the security risk it has been for the area of Kaduna to be taken with his wives and other people. You know, what do you think it's pl playing out now in terms of security in Kaduna State? First, we have to look at what is happening. Why are the kidnappers targeting Kaduna particularly? Kaduna is a home to uh, a lot of uh, tertiary institutions in in, in Nigeria compared to other northern states and, and the seat of um, uh, military installations and military formations in, in, the, in the country. The, the uh, kidnappers and bandits and all of these uh, forces working um, to create a, a, a sense of disharmony in the state um, come from uh, a history of neglecting uh, responsibilities. You know, over, over the years in the northern part of Nigeria mostly, we have uh, thoroughfare movement of people from other parts of, Af uh, of, of West Africa coming in for trade, some coming in for their criminal uh, activities, and they have not been intercepted or stopped. So for a while now, this has been happening, you know, low-key and all of that. Two years, about three years ago, the Agam Adara was also similarly kidnapped, uh, uh, himself and his wife, and one of his uh, uh, personal assistants, and they were declared uh, dead after, some, uh, after a while. Uh, so if uh, that incident did not... Um, uh, bring the authorities, you know, um, authorities' attention to the need to beef up uh, security. Well, what we are seeing now is uh, a continuation of that uh, ease at which uh, criminals and, and, and bandits and, and miscreants are able to pass through the country, get out of the country without being apprehended. And so, uh, uh, even before the uh, kidnap of the of the Emir. We had um, an attack in, in uh, Angon uh, birthday in, in, in Kaduna, part of uh, close to uh, uh, Sabontesha, for example. You have uh, uh, attacks in, in, in Kujama, for example. These things continue and there is no prosecution. So when people kidnap, when people, uh, 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 bandits attack people and nobody is being apprehended or punished, you are yeah. simply saying these things should continue. Ah.
Wow. Well, right. It's quite a sad situation looking at Kaduna State, which is the fourth most popular state in Nigeria with a population of about 12 million people. Now, looking at the economy of, of Kaduna, one would want to ask, with the absence of security operations there and with 40% unemployment rate in Kaduna State, it makes people want to sit and ask what really the government is doing in the state. But with this story in question now, um, people are coming to ask, the bandits, the people who did the abduction, have they tried to reach out to the family of the people that were abducted some way to ask for ransom or even state the reason the action was committed? No, no um, communication has been made to the families yet. Uh, one of the sons of the uh, kidnapped Emia did uh, uh, deliver a message yesterday saying uh, they are still on the trail trying to figure out where the kidnapped uh, uh, persons are at. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the Emia is about 84 years. He may not be able to survive the rigor of moving from the point at which he was kidnapped to the uh, locations where the kidnappers may be moving them. Uh, all fingers are crossed. We don't know how far the security operatives will move this time around, but. It portends a danger for the entire state because uh, kidnapping an emir would mean that anybody could uh, fall into the hands of the uh, uh, kidnappers. And don't forget, yesterday the, the, uh, a train broke down between Kaduna and, uh, and Abuja and uh, a lot of passengers were left at the risk of being kidnapped or attacked by bandits. These issues are unfortunate and we hope uh, it will stop. Well, uh, thank you very much, Abdul Latif Ahmed, News Central's Chief Researcher and Monitoring Desk. Thank you very much for the latest. We'll continue to follow and see if there's going to be any word from Governor El Rafai, mm -hmm. the Governor of Kaduna Thank State. you for having me. All right. I will take a quick breather right here on Breakfast Central, but there's still lots to come on the program. Do stay with us. You are still watching Breakfast Central on News Central on this wonderful Monday morning. Let's uh, bring you the latest when it comes to the front pages. Anyone will do on the papers. And we're starting out uh, with the front page in Liberia. <laughs> All right, looking at Liberia, um, one of the main stories we have here is um, Liberia to benefit about 350 million US dollars. That's what it says. And it's to support economic growth through major infrastructure invest investment in the post COVID 19 era and to support the fight against COVID 19 through vaccinations. That's what it says here. Also, we have um, a big one against pro poor. That's what it says. Against pro poor. That's, that's a big one there. What's it talking about? Talking about people living below the poverty line in Liberia. Well, you need to go to the pages of the front page from Liberia. Mm. It says ruling party youth league frowns at government officials showing off luxury lifestyles in the midst of you know, concrete poverty in the country. All right, let's go straight to the Daily Times. And this one is in Malawi. Uh, and see what they have for this one. It talks about the ex escom board chair on government's neck. And they also have a uh, picture of President Chakwera there. He's quite, you know... Uh, hand, handy when it comes to corruption and taking on the issues. So there you have it, the former Electricity Supply Corporation in Malawi uh, chairman, uh, their written uh, challenges decision to remove him as the ESCOM boss. More on that on the front page. Uh, MCTU to protest controversial labor law. Oh, oh, more on that on the front page. And NCD patients fight for privacy. Delay in Anmark maize purchases ex-farmers and Motag deploy, deploys comedy in ex-convicts awareness. All of that on the front page of the Daily Times in Malawi. Right from the Daily Times, we're going straight on to the Punch newspaper in Nigeria. Uh, the very first one that we have here talks about COVID. COVID-19, third wave. States run out of vaccine. 9,057 travelers disappear. You have that from page 12 of the Punch this morning. Kano exhausts over 200,000 vaccine doses, in increases surveillance at Aminu Kano Airport. You also have um, this one that talks about information blackout. Now, according to the paper, this is what the National Assembly wants to achieve with the NPC and NBC talking about the Media Act 
amendment bills. It's not just against the media. It's about society's right to know your right to be heard. Mm. More details from the punch this morning. All right. Nigerian papers are getting really hot this morning. That's interesting mm -hmm. to see. Uh, let's go to South Africa, where it's all about the president. And it says, uh, stop it now. There have been riots over the weekend regarding the uh, incarceration uh, of uh, former President Jacob Zuma. His supporters have taken to the streets in some places of South Africa. You can see they call it Zuma riots. Uh, some of the uh, places were looted. A couple of shops were looted in places of Johannesburg and violence already, already uh, started out. And the president said, stop it now. Joburg owners wake up to extensive damage of property. Trucking companies fear for lives of drivers. And Ramaphosa slams violence inspired by ethnicity says stop it now also the president is at the top there says level four stays on third wave numbers continue to rise so uh, all about jacob zuma uh where supporters causing violence and the president speaking saying there will be a uh, level four third wave restrictions in the country south africa all right uh, still right here on breakfast central now africa's covid 19 cases keeps rising every day with multiple cases reported from all regions of the continent now it is now the time for our COVID-19 updates right here on Breakfast Central. All right, you are still right here on Breakfast Central on New Central TV. We have Israel on for COVID-19 update. Good morning, Israel. How was your weekend and what is the latest update you have for us? Good morning to you too, uh, Ology and Olisa. Africa, good morning. My weekend was great, but it's time for us to bring you updates on the COVID-19 pandemic on the continent. We head off here from Lagos, Nigeria, where indeed uh, the, the state's government has raised a land over a possible third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic following a recent increase in positive cases. The government of Lagos State, Southwest Nigeria, Babajide Somolu, in a statement announced restrictions and sanctions after disclosing that the state's daily confirmed cases had shot up recently. Now, figures from the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, show the country has seen increase in COVID-19 cases for two weeks, ending on July the 4th. As of yesterday, the 11th of July, 2021, over 168,000 cases have been confirmed in the country and Lagos continues to be the epicenter of the pandemic with over 60,000 cases. The governor said there should be compulsory use of face masks in public places, in addition to social distancing, compulsory temperature checks, provisions of uh, hand washing and sanitizers, and a maximum of 50% occupancy in enclosed spaces. But that for Lagos, well, let's go straight down to Rwanda, where students being treated for COVID-19 under the home based care in Rwanda are to sit their national examinations under strict health protocols. According to the country's education ministry, all examination centers will be set up a separate examination room which will be disinfected every day for the students. Now, the ministry say over 452,000 candidates across the country are expected to sit for their national examinations, including written and practical exams from, the, from June to July. Now, the first written exams will start today, the 12th of July. In Algeria, the Prime Minister, A.M. Bernard Ramani, has tested positive for COVID-19. According to a statement, the Prime Minister has been placed in self-isolation for a period of uh, seven days. In accordance with the medical guidelines, car car carrying out his work from home. Now, he is also due to undergo another screening test at the end of the self-isolation. Algeria has seen a surge in COVID-19 cases in recent days, with confirmed cases rising from around 200 a day just last month to more than 800 today. So well, there you go. That's one of the latest updates uh, around the continent. Uh, but uh, wanted to know that here in Lagos, well, we hear there's a third wave, and apparently seems like uh, uh, isolation centers in the state are beginning to fill up once again. Wow. We hope not. Uh, not advice. as terrible as it was when it mm. first hit Nigeria. Well, but thank you so much, Israel. Thank you for the update. Many thanks. All right, just watching Breakfast Central on News Central. Now uh, it's time for the Africa Report.
Welcome back. Now we have joining us live for African Report, our Zimbabwean correspondent, Lala. Welcome to Breakfast Central, Lala. What's the latest update from Zimbabwe? Um, good morning to you guys. Morning. Well, uh, there's, uh, there's a huge story going on, and this is of 10,000 families that are facing possible eviction and demolition of their houses. And this is happening in the city of Wachitumbiza, which is about 25 kilometers out of Harare. Uh, sorry, this is about 25 kilometers out of Harare. And obviously the local governing body uh, of that city says the reason why they are demolishing these houses, there are three main reasons. The first reason is that some of these people, they bought the land, but then went on to erect structures that were not permitted or that they were not given permission uh, by the local governing body. The second reason is that some of these people, they actually went and settled in, this, in these areas without any legal uh, documentation. Then the third reason is that some of the residents, some of the 10,000 residents from this city where actually they fell prey to land barons who sold them land that either belonged to the state or belonged to the local governing body. Wow. Uh, so how 10,000, you know, uh, people. So we're talking about, you know, thousands upon thousands of families, you know, women, children, life, source of livelihoods affected here, Lala. Tell us what the scale will look like now uh, for this town outside of Harare. Okay, this is this is quite uh, sad because it falls on some uh, demolitions that happened in the same city about two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago to be precise. Uh, what happened was in those two to three weeks ago, uh, the local governing body demolished all informal trader structures. They said the structures were illegal or the structures didn't meet the standard of, of the local governing body. So they demolished them and already people in this city are crying. They're saying, uh, uh, COVID-19 brought them poverty and now the, the local governing body, instead of being on their side, has also gone on to, to demolish their vending structures, uh, their informal trading structures, which has just worsened the situation and at the same time it has increased the, the crime rate in the city. Now Lala, before we let you go, um, looking at the situation of things, and people are trying to earn honest and legitimate living in Zimbabwe. Has mm -hmm. there been any form of compensation for these people whose properties have been um, demol uh, uh, broken down and brought to ruins as we speak? Not at all, not at all. There is no compensation and the local governing body and the government as well, they say that these people are illegal and they know that they are illegal and they've been told over and over again to vacate these premises. So what happens is like with the case of the, the recent pending dem demolitions, um, the administrative court has already issued letters to say they need to be to have vacated the area in such and such a time or else they are coming in and if they do not present documentation they will still go on and 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 demolish their their their, their structures their houses some of these people their houses big houses but there is no more conversation at all all right, thank you very much, uh, Lala, our correspondent from Zimbabwe, bringing us the latest regarding uh, the situation in that town outside Harare. Over 10,000 people are uh, mm -hmm. homeless right now. Well, thank you very much, Lala. We'll catch you once again on Breakfast Central. All right. All right, uh, still Breakfast Central on New Central, coming up next on the program. We'll be talking about ways to prevent and fight cancer. Plus, uh, Italy are uh, Euro 2020 champions after knocking out England on penalties. And uh, sadly, Nigerian music legend dies at 44. All about that.
All right, you're still watching Breakfast Central on this wonderful Monday, the 4th day of July 2020. Don't forget to follow us on all our social media handles. I like to use the word all specifically. Well, we are also wondering, you know, what you're doing, uh, this one here. And uh, Sam Dandy also is uh, also on standby. I've got Oluchi also with me in the studio. But uh, moving on, uh, this one is time to talk about, you know, serious issue of cancer awareness in the general population, which is uh, an absolute essential and uh, the basis on which cancer control program can be constructed. Now, elements uh, that go into cancer awareness and prevention efforts include knowledge and the problem and the solution and to explain more on the defects preventive uh, preventative measures and uh, ways to treat cancer we have dr kelechi okoro a health and wellness expert welcome to breakfast central dr okoro thank you so much thank you for having me good morning to good morning dr watching. okoro good morning now what are the ways of preventing cancer and how much impact has the awareness on cancer had especially here in africa Okay, so I'll just delve in straight up to the ways to prevent cancer. We all need to know that it is um, having a healthy lifestyle because it's so funny that no matter how much you try to do all of these things, cancer still can hit you. But if you're doing the barest minimum or the most that you can, I believe that we can uh, prevent cancers. First of all, um, a healthy lifestyle. Processed foods, really bad for you. Artificial foods are killing us. I want us to stick more to fresh foods and, and um, organic foods. Antioxidant-rich foods are also great. Maintain a healthy weight. I cannot say this enough. We cannot say this enough. Um, cancers generally, are, uh, when it comes to cancers, weight, weight gain is implicated in most of them. So maintain a healthy weight exercise regularly you need to move your body there are a lot of creatives especially who are couch potatoes and we like to just sit in the house and just press our phones our laptops and do the things that we want to do online and also those who live sedentary lifestyles it's a bad thing for you please make sure you exercise and move your body you can take the stairs more and ditch the elevator you know when you have to cycle more walk more instead of driving and this part of the world we think that driving is a big man thing but we need to know that yes you need to get to places where you need to get to that are far but as much as you can when you can walk please 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 walk okay and then um get checked first that's the first thing i should have even said some cancers are preventable okay and then some you have to actually uh they're not preventable so in quotes, because you cannot have it and then, you know, get uh, a preventable method like vaccination. So basically, you have to make sure you get checked regularly. Nigerians, we do not have a good attitude towards getting our health check done. It's not just for cancers, but we're talking about cancers today. So get your health check done. Because if you check early when it comes to cancer, early detection is really key, um, early treatment early detection, early diagnosis, early treatment. So if you get checked regularly, then I guess that you can pick up the cancer early and try to start treating. And then also, like I said before, we have vaccine present preventable um, cancers, like the, uh, the liver cancer, which a cause could be hepatitis. I mean, if you get your hepatitis vaccine, then for that particular cancer, be safe from the hepatitis which right. would eventually lead to liver you know disease and liver cancer and then we also have the breast cancer it's not right. vaccine present preventable but you can get checked and know when to start treatment we also have the cervical cancer which is vaccine present right. preventable there are a lot of them like that okay all right doctor so uh, what's this all right dr kalechikora before we let you go you know uh just like you mentioned, there are so many different types of cancers uh, there, which you know really bedeviling the human body at some at some points, even at early ages. But what do you think will be the earliest symptoms someone can get for any of these cancers? What do you think will be the earliest symptoms? The earliest symptoms are no symptoms at all. That's why we say get checked because you could have cancer and then have no um, symptoms, but eventually you could have weight loss unexplainable weight loss um loss of appetite and symptoms of anemia i mean loss of blood 
okay you're fainting you're having fainting spells you feel fatigued bone pains you feel um some fever you feel um night sweats there are a lot of symptoms that are associated with different cancers there are a lot of cancers so you can say this has to do with this but bone pains headaches fatigue um night sweats loss of appetite and unexplained weight loss there are a whole lot of them so um, it just depends on the cancers that are involved. So don't wait until you have those symptoms to get checked. All right. So get checked regularly, get screened, uh, get vaccinated if you have to. Mm. Early treatment, early detection is really key for cancers. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kelechi Okoro, uh, health and wellness expert for coming on Breakfast Central. We appreciate your time. All right, thank you very much for having me. All right, uh, up next right here, Breakfast Central Entertainment. It's a bit of a sad news in the world of entertainment. The Nigerian entertainment space yesterday woke up to not sort of exciting news at all about the demise of Olari Waju Pasasi, aka Sal Sultan. Yesterday, he died at the age of 44. His death was announced uh, in a statement yesterday by his family. Uh, the statement said Sal Sultan died on a of a rare form of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a group related to cancers that affect the uh, lymphatic system. Now, his relative, Coyote Fasasi, who signed the statement, says Sal Sultan passed on after a hard fought battle with the ailment. And to really break down all of this, we got our entertainment editor, uh, Corey Brown. Corey, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast Central. All a bit in sad circumstances. Yeah, good morning, Olisa. Um, it's a very sad day. Um, Sal Sultan is considered as one of the greatest one of the best to ever do a pioneer mm. of the Nigerian hip hop space, R&B space, Afrobeat space. He's a, he's a musician, a basketballer. Mm. Um, I'm sure you relate to him when it comes to basketball as well. He's <sighs> a, it's a great guy. I mean, growing up, you would, if you don't know Sam Sultan, I mean, he paved the way for quite a number of people. I can mention names from Shea Ishe, Gracie, mm. Blacka, Sean Tizu. Mm. Quite a lot of people came from the Ninja Ninjas umbrella, mm. which was, you know, being managed by Sam Sultan. He's a great guy. Yesterday's news um, has torn the industry apart mm. completely. Because people are still trying to wrap their heads around, you know, yeah, that, that yeah. friend. A couple of weeks ago, the news broke out that he was um, diagnosed of mm. a particular ailment, cancer related. Um, however, you know, the, the um, intensity of such illness wasn't really known and not much was shared mm. online. Um, I'm sure a lot of people tried to reach out to him. However, um, yesterday, waking up yesterday and hearing that you know, he's gone. Yeah, uh, Sal Sultan for no, is known for quite a number of you know hits. Uh, the mathematics hits from back oh, in the yeah. day. Oh yeah, from Jaguar Jantis. Yes. Uh, mathematics, uh, area, mm. um, even down to the new generation, he mm. still gave us a lot of um, great tunes mm. uh, featuring likes of Whiskey, Coco Say, mm. Sal Sultan, um, Two Faced Dibia, oh. Bushmeat. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. I mean, what else? What else can we say? But I, I'm short of words right now. Mm. All I can say is, uh, pray for the family. And the wife we hear is going through a whole lot right and now. And he lives behind how many kids? Three kids. Three kids. Three kids. Um, um, I don't know how they're feeling right now, but you know they're all abroad. Mm. Um, and I pray that, um, I mean, God grant them for you to it, get it lost. It, it, the sad thing about it is that people are shocked about the age of Sal Sultan yes, being 44, 44 years old. But he has made such a huge mark Sal, at such an early age a, musically in Nigeria. 20 years in the industry for Sal Sultan, over 20 years in the industry. I mean, close to 25 years, if you will, from acting to comedy to music itself. Uh, his involvement in basketball is, is yeah. impeccable. If you, if you ask me, and he's great, he's a great guy. He's done so much in a very short period, mm. and it's a great loss for the Nigerian entertainment. And do, do, you, do, you, do you see, you know, perhaps uh, more reactions coming in from other artists, oh, yes. entertainers, yeah. industry bigwigs, because uh, a lot, a lot it's still people, fresh. It's still fresh. A lot of people haven't even, you know, expressed how, um, how they feel about the loss. Um, but however, uh, we're hoping that in the next couple of days, 
um, people will start to reminisce and start to express mm. their feelings. Uh, from New Central, we're definitely going to dedicate the entire okay. week to uh, Sound Sultan, Tan, remembering his music, mm. his work, some of his fun moments and, mm. in the industry. All that will be aired on TV. All right, uh, Kuro Day Brown, our entertainment editor. Thank you very much for coming on breakfast. Thank you very Unfortunately, much. Unfortunately, it's this sad, you know, sad way. To, <laughs> sad way. It's but... a sad way to start the week, but wow. we pray for the best. Oh. All right, uh, we still have a couple of images coming out uh, of the burial of Sal Sultan as it happened yesterday outside Nigeria. I believe it's in the U.S. Yes. Uh, in New Jersey, that's where it occurred. So uh, I, I, I suppose according to Muslim burial, according right? Muslim right, he's been buried. And uh, well, the yeah. wife, the wife was practically destroyed. You know, going through that process. Uh, a couple of Nigerian celebrities were present. Lamborghini was present at the event. Olamide's manager was also present. Um, some other music in, uh, industry personnel were also present at the event. But this burial took place almost immediately after the demise. Well, uh, it's a very sad one. It's it's very it's sad, very sad and uh, you know, people, someone leaning on the body, I suppose, a close relative, uh, perhaps the wife. That's, that's the wife. That's the wife. Actually. And the body being, you know, uh, put into the ground uh, with the use of that huge caterpillar just to lower it down, and they'll have people around there. You know, it's your morning at the same time. You're trying to calculate logistics. It's not the best place to be for anyone, anyone. like you're Nigerian yeah. or American or what have you. It is a quite a sad one. We're just bringing you images uh, as we got them uh, from yesterday. So he was buried immediately at uh, the same day he died, according to Muslim rights out there and uh, in Philadelphia. So Sal Sultan is no more. That is the big shocker. If you're just waking up this morning to the news, that is it. Uh, it's a quite a sad one. Uh, but still to come right here on Breakfast Central. tell you all about Euro 2020. The Italians have taken it to Rome and that's where it's going home. Euro 2020, up next right here on Breakfast Central. You are still watching Breakfast Central on News Central. It's a Monday, so let's look at what happened last night in the world of sports. And we can start with football. Euro 2020. I'm still excited. And I've got Onyechi Obara, first lady of sports. Onyechi, good morning to you. All I can say is uh, Forza Italia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Italians really got the what number over the English yesterday. Finished 1 1 in normal time. We saw. Uh, yes, the penalty uh, missed uh, uh, by Bukayo Saka on the last stage there. But uh, that man there, Donnarumma, is the hero of Italy. He uh, saved that penalty to make sure that Italy could get to win their second Euro 2020. Sad one for Bukayo Saka. He's of Nigerian heritage. He took the last penalty for England. 3-2, it finished in favour of Italy. Yes, uh, that man scored the first goal. Uh, talking about the Manchester United left-back Luke Shaw to give Italy, uh, England a 1-0 lead quite early. But uh, Italy came back into the game. Their uh, defender, Leonardo Bonucci, getting the equaliser. And from then on, it went into extra time. Well, that's a happy man there, Leonardo. Uh, we're talking about Roberto Mancini, 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 the Italian coach. But Onyecio Barro, morning to you. Uh, for the, those of the Italian, you know, sentiments divide. Mm. It's a good Monday morning. Yes, of course. A very good Monday morning, Olisa. It is, especially for the Italians, as the trophy there has been taken to Rome. Well, a lot of people expected that it will be taken home, according to the English team. But um, yesterday, they were put um, a bit um, down, humbled a bit, and the trophy was taken to Rome. It was a good um, concept coming from Roberto Mancini, experience, composure from the Italians. We could see for sure that um, the English team went so fast, so fast with football and got that goal with one matter having to score for them there. But um, the Italians were able to keep their own, compose, still get an equaliser from Bonucci, uh, even with that flip from the English defenders. But at last, it all ran to a penalty kick out and experience took the order of the day. The Italians became the champions of Europe. But it was not a good thing that even football fans have not been able to understand that um, when you lose, it's all about the sport. You win some, you lose some. They had to raise this chance for three of the players who lost their own penalty kick um, in that penalty shootout over there. 
But we'll be hoping that um, the Euro um, European body have something to say to orientate their fans against this kind of racist abuse. All right, so sad one for the English. Uh, it, it's not coming home, it's going to Rome. A good one for the Italians. Uh, but in terms of the, the tournament overall, okay. uh, how would you rate Euro 2020? You know, there were lots of matches played at Wembley, but we did see the logistical headache of you know the group matches from from you know from uh, Brussels to mm. Germany to mm. Rome, to Copenhagen, yeah. and all of that. But I would say um, I would um, rate them in a very high stand because it was really planned, well planned, a well planned event. Looking at the fact that COVID nineteen is really taking a toll on um, the whole sport, but they were able to go through a lot. We could see that there were no match commissioners there to even kick up from the play. We had a little, um, you know, a car which brought the ball all the way from the field to the referee. At least they were able to put some modalities in place to take charge of the event, make the event a very, very glorious one. So I would give them, it's a good preparation, good antics, good planning um, for the whole thing, having to take care of players. And remember the situation of Christian Eriksen. They mm. really, really were on top of the situation with that. All right, Lonya, yeah, I've just been waiting for you guys because I'm all about Copa America. I mean, oh. I'm, uh, wherever Lonya Mercy is now, he needs to be sneezing because I'm calling his name. <laughs> <laughs> What's last. going on? Lucci, at last, at last, of course, Lionel Messi has a silverware to his name that he was able to win for Argentina there. Now, looking at that, this Copa America final really meant a lot to Messi. It was all for Messi, and at last, Argentina took the day with, um, against Brazil. But we had seen that maybe it meant a lot to Neymar too. But after the whole game, it was just sports for him. Mm. You win some, you lose some. So, Argentina are the Copa America uh, champions. All right, we also know that Novak Djokovic won Wimbledon, oh, yes. Wimbledon yesterday in terms of the tennis. But I think the big news from an African perspective it comes from a basketball perspective, where yeah. Nigeria, Nigeria against <laughs> USA. Did we really see well? Did we do? We did we did the, the players. Well. I mean, is that for like for real? Oh, yeah. I mean, is that for real? 90. <laughs> When I was looking at the names of the basketball players, I looked at the names. They were all Nigerian names. In fact, from certain parts of Nigeria. I just don't want to, I don't want to just blow the trumpet yet. I think this is the biggest thing the Nigerian Basketball Federation has ever done for basketball when it comes yeah. to Nigeria. Given, um, getting a new coach, Mike Brown, um, an NBA experienced coach, would say, and having to pick his own players. Mm -hmm. NBA players, the likes of Gab Vincent, Joshua Koge, Chimeze Metu from Sacramento Kings. Um, we had Jordan Nuwara from um, the Milwaukee Bucks, NBA finalists. You could see for sure they are still struggling out over there, but he was able to still stand for his country. It is a big thing and should be known in time memorial that Nigeria were able to go through USA, right. who are so, so strong with basketball. 90 right. there, three mm. points ahead. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Onyechi Obaro. Looks like we're set for Olympics basketball, and yes. uh, we'll take it like that. Yes, of course, Olisa. Say that again. All right, thank you very much, Onyechi. I think that wraps it up for the program for right. today. Yes, uh, we had news, we had talk, we had you know politics and entertainment and sports. But later today on News Central. And we have Business Edge, 11 a.m. West African time with Tolokwe Adele Rubalogo. At 5.30 p.m. is East Central, all about the world of entertainment. And at 7 p.m. West African time, we have Village Square, Africa. To go uh, celebrate Italy's victory. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Breakfast Central returns again. Bye-bye.